Welcome to worship here in Normal First United Methodist Church. I'm glad that you are joining us from wherever you are. Today we will be celebrating Holy Communion, and so as our service begins, I invite you to, to get some bread or crackers, juice, or water so that you are ready to celebrate communion together with us. In our service today, we will be continuing our sermon series as we reflect on the beliefs and the values of our congregation. Last week, Pastor Kent preached on, is Christianity still relevant? And I would encourage you, if you didn't hear that sermon or see the worship service last week, I would encourage you to look that up on our website. This week, my sermon will focus on, is the church supposed to be so judgmental? Well, the short answer to that question is no, but I will expand on that in the worship service and in the the sermon today. As we begin our service, I'm going to invite you to join me in what would be considered a traditional call to worship. I will read a line and then I will invite you to, to join in responding together. This call to worship was written by Reverend Christina Sobania. Let us join together in the call to worship. This new day is fresh with possibility to encounter the living Christ. With bright eyes, let us search. This new day is fresh with possibility to understand the living Christ. With engaged minds, let us ponder. This new day is fresh with possibility to be moved by the living Christ. With compassionate hearts, let us feel. This new day is fresh with possibility to serve the living Christ. With humble intention, let us act. And this new day is fresh with possibility to praise the living Christ. With strong voices, let us sing.
Hi kids, it's Miss Jill. All month of September, we're gonna talk about trust. Now trust is putting your confidence in someone that you can depend on. And we know that we can always put our trust in God and hopefully we can put our trust in each other too. Our memory verse for September kids is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. And that's Proverbs 3, 5. So we're going to look at Genesis, the very, very beginning. God made an amazing world. And then sin entered the picture and people turned away from God. But still, God had a plan. God has this great big story that we are a part of. Anyway, God picked two people to be part of the special plan, Abraham and Sarah. Now, God promised them both that they would have more kids than stars in the sky and that their family would be blessed and that their family would be a blessing for the world. But there was this one thing. Abraham and Sarah were already old. They were already like, grandparent age and so Sarah kind of laughed like I don't think that's going to happen um, and then she was kind of scared years and years and years go by no babies and then sure enough Sarah has her first baby they were shocked they were amazed God's promise came through after all those years and that baby's name was Isaac. And in Genesis 21, 6, it says, God has given laughter to me. Sarah said this after she has Isaac. God has given laughter to me. Everyone who hears about this will laugh. So let's laugh. <laughs> it was laughter from joy. Joy of that God's promise came through and that she had her first baby, even after she waited and waited and waited, but she never stopped trusting God. They had to wait a long time for God's promise to come true. And the awesome thing is that God's it, it, timing is never wrong, and we can always trust God. Our bottom line this week, kids, is trust God even when you have to wait. It is so hard to wait. Even us grown-ups have a hard time waiting, too. But being part of God's great big story, we don't know what's going to happen. We have to trust God. But guess what? Eventually, God would bless the world through Abraham and Sarah with all of their kids. And guess who ended up being part of the family line? Jesus. We can learn from that story that we, too, can trust God even when we have to wait. I love you and I miss you. Bye. Today we are going to read John chapter 8 verses 1 through 11. While Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to, him, said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on do not sin again. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1-5 through 5. Do not judge, so that you may not be judged. For the judgment you will be give will be the judgment you get, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eyes, but do not, do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye, while the log is in your own eye? 
you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. When we stop to think about it, our cultural values these days can be very confusing. There are strong voices and opinions on every side and every angle of any social or personal issue that we could talk about. And it seems like this has spilled over into the culture of the church as well. But the church was never intended to reflect society's latest whim. The Christian faith was never intended to side with the loudest or with the majority. Our faith has a core set of principles established from centuries of our faith tradition that are meant to be our guide and not change with the latest trend. Our faith is meant to be strong enough to stand on its foundation, its core values, and flexible enough to interpret what this means for this time and place. From our daily prayers this past week, we heard these words from the poem titled, God of the Summer Tree. The roots of the summer tree grow deep in the soil of the spirit, spirit that binds us all in one. The trunk of the summer tree stands firm yet bends as needed, strength that feeds and holds the whole. So in this five-week sermon series, the title of this week's sermon is this. Is the church supposed to be so judgmental? Obviously, the answer is no. Being judgmental, I'm sure, has been around as long as humanity has been around, but it sure feels like it's exploded in these recent years. And this trend in our world today has hugely infected and impacted the church. Being judgmental is believing that we have the right to pronounce judgment on the actions and lives of others, sometimes and oftentimes when we know very little about their lives. And this increasing trend of being judgmental is driving people away from the very place, faith communities, the church, from the very place that is intended to be life-giving and a source of grace. Now, I'll start by saying what you already know. Being judgmental doesn't mean that there aren't any situations where you have to use good judgment. We need to use good judgment. So I'm not talking about the kind of judgment that we must use every day to stay safe, to make wise decisions. I'm not talking about the kind of judgment that a judge would use to interpret the law, to decide a person's guilt or innocence. I'm not talking about judgment that we need to use to determine, let's say, the best cake in a cake decorating contest or the best performance in a dance competition. Judgment in these situations and many others is necessary and it helps us to grow, to improve. This kind of judgment keeps us safe, makes us accountable for our actions and helps us to improve. But the kind of judgment that we read about in the scriptures today is judgment that doesn't help us improve, that doesn't have the best interests of the other person in mind, and doesn't understand the whole picture. When Jesus was with the crowd gathered around the woman, as we heard in the scripture, and they were all ready to condemn her, he saw a woman in great need, a woman who was broken, a woman who knew herself that she had hit rock bottom. She didn't need others to tell her that. The crowds, though, only saw a woman who didn't fit in with them, one whose life was a big mess, and all they could focus on were her mistakes. All they could focus on were her sins. And when Jesus said, okay, you can condemn her, if you haven't made any mistakes yourselves, then everything changed. All of a sudden, the mirror was held up to their face, and they had to face their own guilt and sins. They had to recognize what Matthew says is the log in their own eyes. The kind of judgment that they wanted to throw out was the kind that isn't healthy, and it eats away at our souls. 
This is the kind of judgment that makes us feel that we're better for a moment, that makes us feel superior, that, that really does us no good and doesn't benefit the other at all. In fact, it separates us from one another because it creates an us versus them mentality. It creates a feeling of being better than them. And it impairs and it impacts our relationship with them. It doesn't draw us closer to them at all. And it blocks us from truly offering help and support. So if we're wondering if the church is in, to be in the business of being judgmental, I would again strongly say that the answer is no. Because we're in the business of building up people, of drawing people together, of working towards reconciliation and restoration, of health and healing. And being judgmental never moves us in that direction. When we're judgmental, we're generally seeing the other through a very small lens. Imagine looking at the world through a straw. I can barely see the camera that I'm looking at that allows me to come into your home. Looking through a straw says, allows me to see very little, almost nothing. And this is what being judgmental could be like. We can only see a very small amount of the story. When we're judgmental, we have very little information, and so we're not able to make good and wise decisions. Jesus understood that when he said to them, you can judge, you can cast the first stone if you've not sinned yourself. Drawing conclusions about someone else's life requires that we have a lot of more information than we generally do. And it also means that we need to have compassion and humility and love for them as well because we can't make good judgments about somebody that we don't care about. One morning, early morning, I was out walking our dog, and it was wintertime, and I noticed that as I was shuffling around on the icy sidewalks and oftentimes opting to walk in the crunchy grass, my four-legged friend appeared to have absolutely no trouble walking along, crisscrossing the sidewalks and chasing that occasional squirrel. I think I saw her slip maybe one time, but she never went down and she never missed a beat. So what made the difference? Me walking so cautiously and she prancing along? The conditions were the same for us, but we didn't have the same resources. We humans have two legs, and my dog has four legs. And balancing on all fours makes us a lot steadier than balancing on just two. Have you ever seen a two-legged table? So as she crisscrossed her way along the sidewalk and followed the smells of the animals that had come before her, I walked very slowly and carefully, shuffling most of the time. My walking had to be deliberate and thoughtful. I had to take it slow and easy. I had to put some thought into what I was doing. So I want to suggest to you that we could use this analogy when it comes to judging others. First of all, we need to think before we speak. Our words should be thoughtful and deliberate when we are in the midst of a slippery, difficult situation. We need to approach these situations slowly and carefully so that we can be thoughtful about our words and actions. And secondly, then watching my four-legged dog reminded me that more is better. More legs are better for walking on the snow and ice, and more is better when it comes to judge, jumping to conclusions or judging others. More information, more time, more compassion, more humility all make our words more helpful. When we judge just based on appearances or emotions, or based on one interaction with somebody, our judgment is likely to be inaccurate and unhelpful. 
judging based on only what we see and oftentimes only what we can see like we're looking through a straw doesn't take into account all of the other factors of their lives. That's like trying to walk on an icy sidewalk with only two legs. It's difficult to do and it's quite slippery. And if we try it, we might fall. This kind of judgment is really best left up to God and churches that are judgmental, I believe, are not reflecting God's love and grace. Carrie Newhoff, who's a pastor and author and a, and a leader, has written extensively on the challenges the church is facing today. And one article he wrote was titled this, How Judgmentalism is Killing Your Church and Three Ways to Stop It. One of the three ways he offered is this, practice discernment, not judgment. I'm going to borrow his words because I think he expresses it really well. He says, judgment is a loaded term in our culture. The original Greek term is a little less loaded. It means to decide. When I try to judge in the way we think of it in terms of our Western world, it's almost never helpful. But when I try to discern, it can be very helpful if done well. He said, here's the rule of thumb I use to check my motives. Judgment, at least the way most of us practice it, is almost always distorted and destructive. Discernment, by contrast, is helpful and restorative. There are always issues to deal with, but when I try to exercise discernment, I am always so much better. Discernment exercised well helps people and can lead towards restoration. He concludes with this reflection. The church, paradoxically, is the place where I have felt most judged and I have felt most helped. No one has been more hurtful than some Christians. And honestly, no one has been more helpful than many Christians I know. My life is so much better because I have had a circle of wise and loving Christians around me now for decades. And then he leaves us with this question. Could you imagine what would happen if we eliminated the harm and instead simply offered the help. us pray. God, you have gifted us with this day, whether it's morning, midday, or evening. Your imprint is upon this day, bringing beginnings to endings and hope to despair. For all of the ways that you weave your love and your spirit into our world, we give you thanks. It is with awe when we open our hearts and eyes that we see your creation. Your handprint is upon all people, giving us a, a glimpse of who you are in each person we look upon. 
We thank you for your great love and we pray for just a little more of your ability to love as you do. We pray for eyes that are compassionate, for hearts that are kind, and minds that are open. We pray for actions that show humility and grace. God, guide us in our loving and our serving, that we may better reflect you. Guide us in our speaking, that we may show humility. We pray today for all who find life difficult, for all whose hearts are full of sorrow and who find the way forward difficult. Hold them close and put in their paths people and resources to help them along the way. We pray today for all who have been hurt by harsh judgment, for the pain that it has caused. We pray for healing for them. And we pray today for forgiveness for ourselves, for the times that we have put judgment upon others. May we ask, may we accept your forgiveness with the commitment that we will strive to better love and care for others. Increase our humility in order that we may more fully love. Oh God, thank you for your love and your grace. We pray all these things in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have the table in front of us, and I trust in front of you, you also have some bread and juice or crackers and water. So we gather around this very large table in all of the places that we are and join together in the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread. He gave thanks to you and he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, remember me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and in all of the places where we are. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, 
until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. This is Christ's table and all are invited to receive. You do not need to be a member of normal First United Methodist Church or of any Methodist denomination because Christ invites all to his table who are seeking, who are hungry, who are desiring to be fed. I invite you now to take a piece of bread, remembering that this represents to us the gift of God's love, the gift of God's hope. Take and eat. And as Jesus did following the meal, he gave thanks to God and he passed this cup around and said, every time you drink of it, remember me. And so in these moments, let us remember Christ. Let us pray. O oh God, through the mystery of this meal, may the power of your love continue to work and form and shape us so that what we do and what we say may reflect your love and your grace. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Oh, oh, oh.
blessing which we bless. And we, though many, throughout the earth, we are one body in this one. Thanks for joining in worship. Wherever you are, we are so grateful that you are gathering with us in this time of worship. Our sermon series continues next week and the series title will be, Why is Being a Part of a Community So Important? I could go on and on about all the reasons I think that that is really vital. I am glad that you are part of this faith community. And if there are ever ways that we can be of support to you, please don't hesitate to reach out. My prayers go with you as you go into this week. May you feel God's presence and be strengthened by his love. And may all of our words and actions and thoughts reflect God's love as we go into this new week. Take care and have a great week. the earth. We are